Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church in Corinth, Mississippi. Thank you for being with us this morning. Please register your attendance with us on those inside aisle pew pads. Pass them down your pew and back so we know with whom we're worshiping. We promise not to uh, uh, incorrectly use your information and sell it to somebody who's trying to sell you something. We just want to keep up with one another. Um, inside the bulletin, there are a couple of things we need to be aware of. And a couple of things that aren't in there that we want to encourage you about is the responsibility we have as First United Methodist Church to be the peanut butter church. Remember that? We are those who provide peanut butter to the Amen Food Pantry, uh, and the stores are getting low, so the next time you're in a grocery store, pick up an extra jar or two of peanut butter. There are bins back there in the narthex for that purpose. Also, there's a bin back there for the Lighthouse tutoring session snacks, and so uh, when you uh, are also in the grocery store, pick up an extra uh, box of Little Debbie's or Nabs or whatever so that uh, we can get those to the tutors uh, down at the Lighthouse. You'll also see announcements there about the Council on Ministries, the Quest, and the Three Gates Conference, specifically related to the Quest classes. Also on page four, at the bottom of the page there, you'll notice that the Quest classes under John's direction will begin on the 13th, which is at lunch. Now, this is Super Bowl Sunday. All right? So uh, we're not going to miss church that morning because of Super Bowl that night, right? Good. So, I got a commitment out of everybody. So, we're going to be here regularly scheduled uh, Sunday school, church, and quest class uh, on that morning. And if you uh, intend to come, please uh, use the tear off there and put that in the offering plate this morning so we know how many people need to be prepared for, for lunch that day. Also, back on page three at the bottom of the page related to the Corinth Music Club, we need to be aware that that is going to occur this Thursday, the 27th. That is down at the chapel, and the Lisa Lambert Band will be with us. Bless the Lord. saying that there had to be a whole bunch of people to get together to worship God. I heard two or more. We definitely got that. But it is a great time for us, whether we are together in large numbers or in small numbers or individually, to lean on God's everlasting arms. Please join us as we open our worship service.
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. I think there are a lot of people here, Dave. <laughs> so glad to see each and every one of you this morning. I'm Ginger Jones Holland, if you have not known me in the past, and I'm so thrilled to be back home and to be able to help John in this new year and to be with all of you that I love so much. He won't be with us the next couple of Sundays, so this morning we're blessed to have Bud uh, with us to preach today, and next Sunday Kim Ratliff will be with us uh, to preach, so I know you'll look forward to that. There are many things that we share as the body of Christ together. So let's go to him and let's pray. Father, we don't have to invite you to be with us because you never leave us or forsake us. This morning we praise you that you sent your son Jesus. That his blood covers a multitude of sins. Lord, that you have called us and claimed us. And when we claim you back, you have redeemed us. And we have great hope for eternity because of you, because of your son. And Lord, this morning, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be welcome in this place. Lord, we thank you that the Helper has come. That Lord, when we have opened our hearts to the Holy Spirit, we experience your presence every day. And we can live that scripture that says to pray without ceasing. We thank you that your Spirit prays for us with words too deep for understanding when we don't know how to pray for ourselves. And Lord, there are so many names on this list. Lord, let them not just be a list. Lord, let us truly and deeply love and care for one another. Lord, you've called us to lay down our lives for one another. That means many different things. So, Lord, help us to care. Put a deep yearning in us to know you more and more. Put a deep desire for us to reach out to a community. Many who don't know you or who don't have all they need or who are desperate and in despair. Lord, thank you that your word tells us that we don't have to live in fear. We live in a day that's different than any other day that any of us has ever experienced. And Lord, we praise you that none of it surprises you. That your spirit, you give us hope. Your word that reminds us to be of good courage, to not fear. For you have given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So Lord, we claim those sound minds and the wisdom that you give us to live, to work, to worship, to love. Lord, draw this body close together. Draw us close to you. And Lord, give us a heart for all those in this whole community that know and love you. Lord, we pray for the unborn. We pray for our nation. We pray for the Supreme Court. Lord, we pray for so many decisions being made. We pray for those in authority that have the right to make decisions for us. Lord, that they would seek your face and that they would obey your word, and your law. Thank you, Father, that we are not alone. Thank you that you love us and you've provided everything that we need. We pray together 
the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now if you would please stand and join me as we affirm our faith with one of the ancient creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed. It's found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Well, good morning, Corinth. As we say in the South, how y'all doing? It's good to uh, always be back, because when I come back, I come home and to Corinth. And uh, You know, as a boy, I never thought about living in Corinth, like I never thought of living in Iuka, and I, I told them that. I don't know that they appreciated that very much, but... But both Corinth and Iuka have turned out to be the uh, high points of ministry as I think back. The two places probably, and it's not, you know, the two places that have blessed me the most. And uh, I'm glad to be on the team. Some of y'all know that the cat has come back. I mean, really come back. And uh, I'm looking forward so much to being in ministry with Ginger and uh, Kim and John and others on this team, Dave, and, uh, and we look forward to what God's going to be doing in this church in, in days to come. I want to give you a little bit of an update. I'm, this is a moment of personal privilege, <clears throat> and I hope you understand it, and then we'll move on with what we're supposed to do here in, in the preaching task. Uh, you know, the last time we were here, Sandra came with me. And this was around the 1st of December, and she had, we, we enjoyed a, Sandra has dementia, in case some of you don't know. And uh, she, we went through a nine-month period of just, just beautiful time, and, uh, you know, a recreation and renewal, and, uh, but I, I hate to say this, she's kind of hit another gear. And we are uh, in a place that where we're going to be having to work hard and to you know, to hold things together. Uh, I have to tell you this story about her that happened just last night, uh, and I hope you appreciate the spirit of it. Uh, I, I'm not, you know, you, you know, I'm always trying to make you smile or laugh or something. But uh, <clears throat> she has, she, she's forgotten who we are. She's at that place. And so when I got in bed last night at 10 o'clock, uh, by 10 o'clock, she was already in bed. And uh, I, got, I got in, pulled the covers up over me, head on the pillow, and, and here came this question from Sandra. She says, who are you? <laughs> I said, well, it says, I'm Bud. I said, she said, oh. And I said, who are you? And she says, I'm Sandra. And I said, well, nice to meet you, Sandra. Now let's get some sleep. <laughs> well... You just have to find the, the smile in it where you can. But you know, I, I, I trust in a good God. I, I've had a lot of conversations with God, as probably many of you have, have had when you've been going through difficult times and you were facing questions that had no answers. And you, you know, I've ranted and railed and I've fussed and fumed with God. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure that He has looked at me and smiled. And He says, said more than once, do you remember Job? You, you remember the story of Job? It's in the last chapter or so where he says, uh, okay, Job, I hear your, your rants and your fuss and your complaint, but let me ask you a question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And, and I don't think God meant that in an ugly way. He just wanted to remind Job. He says, listen, I've got this under control. Maybe you can't see it. Maybe you don't understand it, but it's going to work out. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's not the sermon this morning, but isn't that a good thought? When we face questions we have no answer to. And grief that we don't know how to handle. We trust God. Uh, God is faithful and just, and He will always walk with us. Well, you know, this morning I want us to think about <clears throat> something, and, and I want to, and I, I, you know, a sermon is, uh, you know, I think another word for it is exhortation or preaching or whatever you want to call it. And I always kind of thought a lot of times that when I was preaching, I was preaching at. That's never my intent in preaching. My intent is to converse. And to have us reflect on things that uh, maybe God wants us to hear. 
You know, when, when, as you listen this morning and as I talk, I, I want you to understand this in a conversational way. We're having a conversation. And we're going to have a conversation around the words of Jesus. And, and, and if I am correct, uh, th- these, these words that I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6 uh, come from a visit that Jesus and his disciples made to the temple. It may have been the third visit that they had made to the temple. Now, imagine the temple, uh, and as you will, it, in, in its heyday, it was gleaming gold and dazzling white. So if you were a pilgrim coming to Jerusalem, and you, and you saw the sun reflecting off the gold and the, dazzl- and the white of the temple, it was just an astounding sight to see. And, 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 one, of the, and, and one of the disciples asked Jesus, or just said, you know, wow, what a sight. This is going to just be here forever. Will it not? And, and Jesus took the opportunity to respond in this way. These are beautiful words that I think you're probably familiar with. Where, where Jesus said to his disciples, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here are the powerful words. Boy, these are just like a dagger to the heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. In the day of Jesus, in the day of Jesus, uh, in that part of the world, an individual's wealth often consisted in in fine and elaborate clothes, unless you were really poor. There's a story about Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, who, who, who wished to make some forbidden prophet out of the prophet Naaman, after his master had cured him. And so he asked him for a talent of silver and changes of clothing. You know, most of us here this morning, uh, we don't have room in the closets, you know, for all the clothes we have. In that day, clothing was a luxury, especially fine clothing. But Jesus said, don't get your heart too set on your fine clothing. Because when you put it in storage, the moth will come. And the moth will eat and consume your clothes. And then he said he, uh, something about things that rust. Now, in, there's a, the word that is translated rust here in the passage literally means eating away. Eating away. And and this is the only place here in Matthew where the word is used to convey rust. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where rust consumes or eats away. William Barclay suggests that in the the Middle East that that the wealth of many individuals uh, consisted much in, in corn and in grain that were stored away in barns. And the problem came when the worms and the rats and the mice would infest the grain and render the store polluted and destroyed. That's really more what it means. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because something's going to come in and infest it and eat it up and it will rust away and will no longer be of use. And then Jesus said, Avoid treasures which thieves can break into your house and steal. I call the security company with whom we do business. Maybe you're like me. You're, you have, you know, security system where, you know, if, I hate it when I forget that it's on and walk out the door. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things, and it happens, I think, with age, and I admit to it, 
Nine times out of ten, when I back out of the driveway, I put the garage door down. But I forget that I put the garage door down. Anybody resemble that remark? So I wind up going around the block just to be sure that the garage door is down. I took care of it the other day. I made a call. I said, do you have anything in your store that I can put on my garage door opener that will let me know when my door is up or down? It's going to be installed Friday. Praise the Lord. (laughs) In the Middle East, they didn't have such things in Jesus' day. In fact, most of the homes that people lived in were just... Uh, thin walls made of adobe mud. So it was real easy, you see, for a thief just to dig through the wall and get at your treasure. Jesus says, don't put your trust in treasures where people can dig through your walls and steal all that you have. Well, it's not walls these days where people steal your money. It's the internet. Been through that twice in a year. Once a ransom note. It was, I, I, again, I try to find humor in it because someone says, I want you to, they want me to send 1,000, uh, what is it, uh, what's that new co- coin? The, okay, whatever it is. But, but I, you know, they say, oh, we want $1,000 in Bitcoin. I don't, I don't understand that stuff. But I think, you know, one Bitcoin may be worth several thousand dollars, so I think they were asking for about a million. And I laughed and I said, well, good luck. Wait on. <laughs> it ain't coming. That's the world we're in. Is anyone like me and just a little bit antsy and suspect when you go online wondering if you've got enough security built in to prevent that from happening? That's the world we live in. So don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth and put your trust in those kinds of things because all of these things, the moth, the rust, and the thief will come and take it from you. And when Jesus and his disciples were looking at that beautiful temple, they thought, well, that's going to last forever. You know what I thought was going to last forever? I thought that church downtown on Fillmore would. You know, I I value that church more than just for its beauty because it's one of the most beautiful places that I have ever worshipped in or preached in. I was ordained in that church in 1970. So it had much value to me, much sentimental value to me. Baptisms, funerals, weddings, worship, Easter, Christmas. Where your heart was touched and moved in that building. But buildings, like people, pass away. It's not the building we worship. It's not the stuff we're called to worship. Jesus says, reach for something higher. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consume, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Jesus was teaching us an important lesson about treasure and what's valuable. Let me suggest some things that are valuable to me. And it's it's, it's couched in a question my Sandra often asks me. She says, how long do you want to live? And I said, well, honey, I'd never really put a number on it. I said, but you know, as long as I have fairly good health, good physical health, and as long as I have my mind and I can think and reason, you know, I just want to hang around. Isn't one of the treasures that God gives us 
is a sound body and mind. And if you have one, you give praise to God for that. And, and make use of your body and your mind to make a difference in the world. And to bless people with it. You know, I, when I started out in life, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't raised in a family that was dirt poor. But we weren't rich. <clears throat> My daddy loved to tell the story about where he grew up. And, and I, y'all may remember I mentioned Choctaw County any number of times. You know, it is, it is not the, the Taj Mahal of Mississippi or anywhere else. Daddy loved to say it. This was his saying about Choctaw County. He said, Bud, Choctaw County is so poor that a, uh, that a buzzard has to pack his lunch to fly across. You know? <laughs> Pretty true. I mean, and you know one thing? He left us in the inheritance. That's four kids. He left us 160 acres of, uh, of timber and swamp land. I've got some swamp land for sale if you'd like it. 40 acres, and I'll throw in the mule. <laughs> but we didn't grow up with much in the way of, you know, we had, mother would say, and you've heard me say this, but I have to say it again. She said, would often say at supper time, we'd say, Mama, what are we having for supper? And she'd say, well, we're having a thousand things, and they all peas. Black-eyed peas and cornbread. I ate that many a night. It was good. Nourishing. But you know, as, as I didn't grow up with much. And um, <clears throat> along the way, I, you know, I have learned that as I came into money, it was really funny Ginger, maybe you've realized, maybe, I don't know if you've realized this or not, but do you know that I make more money retired than I do working? It was a no-brainer to retire. But you know what? <clears throat> it, uh, God has this, this, uh, this question or challenge that he gives us. You know, I, I think he wants us to work in life and earn. But it's more for the money, right? It's more than just about, you've got to make money to, have a, to pay the house note and put food on the table and raise your kids and send them to college and all this kind of stuff. But when God entrusts us, he, he gives us these things, but we're to be, there's a word, steward. Now, we, we preachers have corrupted that word over the years. We do it every fall when we send out a pledge card. So that the only concept that many church members have of the word stewardship is they want a pledge card from me. More to it than that. When you are a steward, you are entrusted with what belongs to someone else. And I want to remind all of us this morning that all that you are and all that you have, all that you ever hope to be, is a gift to you from God. It really doesn't belong to you. It was given to you in trust for you to manage and to work with and again to bless others with. So you see, when I think about true treasure, I think about all the gifts that God has given me. Food, family, health, and trust me, my friends, more than ever, more than ever, now do I realize the value of relationships and people and wife, wife and children. You know, one day they're going to take me under. And I'm going to leave this body and I'm going to go on to be with the Lord. All these things that I'm talking to you about are treasures to me. People, relationships, the gifts that God has given to me. 
But let me tell you the greatest gift, and I think you already know what it is. And that gift is Jesus. Now, I don't understand all about theology. I, you know, the older I get, the more questions I have about faith and life. God did not call any of us to be more religious. In fact, God save us from people who just want to be religious. God help us not be just religious. What God is doing every day, I believe with all my heart, He is calling every one of us into a relationship with Him. A very personal and deep and intimate relationship. The Apostle Paul realized this so very much when he, when he talked about this treasure of faith. And here's what he says. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Cracked pots. Sometimes pieces of clay. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the glory might belong to God. You know, I want to spend the rest of my life Reminding the church of that. And that coming to church isn't just to come to sing hymns. And it's not just to come here just to hear a sermon or to Sunday school lesson. The church is here. We come together to support one another. To love one another. Even in our differences. So that the Holy Spirit might come into our hearts and continue to transform us until we find our place in heaven. That's a treasure. And you know, Jesus is the gift and Jesus is the treasure because Jesus has made all of this possible. He has bridged the gap. He has cleaned the slate of your sins. He died for your sins. He died so that you might be reconciled to God. And trust me, we, 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 if you're like me, you transgress every day multiple times. But Jesus Christ paid the price for all your sin. You know, when I think about just my sin, do you know your sin? Do you know it? Do you ever feel it? Does it ever make you wince when you think of it? Listen, I've got enough material to fill several novels. And I'm sorry for every one. But if I could say one thing to you this morning, your greatest gift in this life, your greatest treasure is Jesus. He is your Savior. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. At His feet every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that He is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. See, Jesus says, don't look at the things of this world for your ultimate satisfaction. Enjoy them. If you've got a beautiful home, a beautiful wife, beautiful kids, beautiful car, enjoy it. But my friends, it's not going to last forever. If you've got a lot of money in the bank, enjoy it. Because one day your kids are going to spend it. Don't set your heart just on the things that you see and what you can touch and what you can feel. But set your hearts on the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. <clears throat> I never will forget the story of the, the black lady. I, I heard, her name escapes me. That's the problem with sometimes preaching without notes. She was singing at a Billy Graham crusade and uh, she was singing this great uh, 
him and uh, and which also escapes my memory here. But but when she finished, she she just stopped and she says to the crowd, and it was probably it was in Jackson, Mississippi, back in the back in the seventies. She just looked at the crowd, and here's what she said. She says, "I love you all." She says, "I'll be I'll see you all in heaven." And then she finished by saying, I'll be looking for you. That's what I want to say to you. You know, I'm not about to go. I might. You know, I'm okay. I I love to joke and and shouldn't joke about that, but I do. I say, you know, heaven's my home, but I'm not that homesick quite yet. There's a few, few more things I'd like to do and see in this world, but if the Lord takes me now, well and good. I'm ready. And I hope you are. I hope your heart's ready for that. Set your mind on things above. Where Christ is. Seated to the right hand of God. Well, friends, where is your treasure? Hear what Jesus said. Take it to heart, really. It's not like hope that you don't take this as a downer sermon like, oh, I'm not supposed to enjoy it. No, I don't mean that. Enjoy your life to the brim. Every bit of it. Savor it. Embrace it. Look at it. Praise God for it. But always realize that there's more to it. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves what? Treasure in heaven. That's what I pray for you today, that you will know in your heart the goodness of God and the heaven toward which He directs you. May we pray. Almighty God, we give you grateful thanks for all of your good gifts. And forgive us, Lord, when we have uh, taken your gifts for granted. And when we've not been good stewards, Lord, convict us, renew us, restore us, redirect us in this life so that we might store up those treasures for heaven, which is your desire, the desire of your heart for us. Bless us and keep us in your love as we pray in the name of Christ, our Savior. As, as Sarah plays, you know, it, it, let's do the old-fashioned old thing. If you want to come down to the altar, why don't you come down to the altar and renew your relationship and your commitment with Christ? Or if you just want to do it where you're sitting, do it where you're sitting. But I'm going to ask Sarah to play for us, and let's, let's bow in prayer and, uh, and, and, and be thoughtful of God and His working in our hearts as we renew our commitment to Him.